Hey, could everybody please take their seats? We're going to get started here. I know people are kind of making their way back from lunch, but we have a busy afternoon and we want to get going here so we uh, can get all the great conversation continuing. So hopefully you all enjoyed that lunch. I know I certainly enjoyed hearing from Jimmy and just uh, appreciating his art and um, you know, I know, I'm speaking on behalf of Claudia, but I would really, as a Minnesotan, I would really like to see Minnesota make um, Hispanic Heritage Month bigger than ever, because uh, that's an, our opportunity to sort of take it and run. So whatever you all can do, I know that the We Are All Human uh, team is ready and uh, willing and able to help you in any way they can. So, um, hey, all of you in the back, can you kind of have a seat? And like, we've got some really good stuff coming now, so we want to get everybody uh, sit down. Um, so what do we got going this afternoon? Well, the first thing is we're going to have a really uh, unique conversation with a number of local council representatives, so that should be very exciting. Following this, um, we're excited to gather leaders who represent a few companies. Um, who have made uh, the commitment to the Hispanic community through the Hispanic Promise, um, led by 3, 3M. Uh, this conversation means a, 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 a lot to me personally, um, because maybe many of you don't know this, but I was actually um, working with Claudia, the author of the Hispanic Promise. So um, when I said earlier that this um, community means so much to me, um, Claudia and I got together um, with some help from the team and figured out a way to really get notice by corporate America, get them to actually say, yes, we're committing to helping Hispanics in our companies through promotion, through development, through hiring and retention. So I'm, I can't tell you how thrilled I am every time I get a review of the Hispanic Promise just to see how well it's been embraced and you know, for many of you uh, to know that we're going to continue to work on the Hispanic Promise and even take it to a higher level, because right now it's a commitment. But how do we hold folks accountable for the things that we know need to get done? And the work we're doing here today um, is really helping feed into that. What do we need to hold everyone accountable for to be able to make the kind of change that needs to be made? So anyway, we'll have a very d nice discussion on the Hispanic Promise. Um, uh, and then if you're still here after that, uh, we're going to be, um, if any companies here have not signed, we'll be, we'll be hitting you up for it. Um, and then following the conversation, uh, we will hear best practices uh, on reaching the Hispanic community. So we're going to get a number of people to help that. And finally, hopefully you'll all stay. There's a reception following uh, this afternoon's uh, sessions uh, from 4 to 6. So um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to the next panel. Hi there, my name is Christina Antello. I'm the CEO of Ferox Strategies. Uh, I appreciate the invitation from Claudia to join you all today. There's not a lot of Latina-run lobby shops in Washington, and so I appreciate every time she, she includes me. Um, I hope you all enjoyed your lunch. Uh, we um, are happy that you are joining us now uh, for a conversation with various consuls uh, from Latin American countries, uh, including Chile, Mexico, and El Salvador. And in order to help talk about their experiences with their communities as U.S. Hispanics and also about the opportunities to collaborate between the countries and the Hispanic community here in the United States. Um, so with that, uh, I know I'm not supposed to introduce you or spend too much time with that. We've got your bios up here. Um, but, you know, in our conversations in preparation for today, um, I was actually kind of blown away by some of the, the stories that they were able to tell them, not just statistics and the numbers, but kind of the growth that their communities have seen in this region. Um, you know, I'm from Texas, I live in D.C., I have family in Florida, I've lived in California, all of those places I expect Latinos. Um, but when I think of the Midwest, I didn't think about it so much. Um, so again, when I heard some of these um, statistics um, and, and some of the, the, the growth, uh, it is really um, 
interesting and it is, it is signi significant about our community. So maybe I'll turn it over to you, Mr. Ambassador, if you could start first uh, and talk to us a little bit about the Mexican community. Thank you very much. Thank you to all the hosts and sponsors, the organizers of this very important, very relevant conference. And thank you very much to everyone here for this opportunity to share our experiences, what we have uh, at the Mexican consulate in St. Paul, Minnesota, is a very young uh, uh, history. Um, the, we set shop in the year 2005 with my good friend, Consul uh, Nathan Wolf, and had the opportunity to have wonderful uh, head consuls like Nanette, Ana Luisa Fajer, and of course, Alberto Fierro. And what we see is the, the growth of the Mexican community it has been very visible. Right now we have more than 300,000 people uh, born in Mexico or of Mexican origin living in the area that we serve, that is uh, Minnesota, South Dakota, uh, North Dakota, and the western counties of Wisconsin. And uh, our consulate is a consulate devoted to closeness to people and devoted to services. Over a, a span of five years, uh, I, may, I, did a num I, I ran the numbers, and most uh, 70 to 75% of all Mexican families and uh, individuals living in the area have received some service at least one service from the consulate. So that is a, 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 a benchmark of closeness because uh, as we say in Mexico, mi casa es su casa, but for uh, this, this means that the consulate is truly the, 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 the house of the home of all Mexicans. And we are thrilled to see that last week uh, we gave the, the warmest welcome to Minnesota to the newest Consulate General in Minnesota, in St. Paul, the Consulate General of our sister republic of El Salvador. I really um, salute the initiative of the government of El Salvador to set shop in Minnesota. And uh, please uh, join me. Let's put our hands together for this initiative. Thank you. So maybe that's a good segue for you um, to go and talk to us a little bit about El Salvador as well. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, everybody here. Thank you for the invitation. Um, as Ambassador Sierra just said, um, El Salvador, we just opened the doors for our newest consulate last Friday. Uh, I want to apologize on behalf of my colleague, Consul Cruz, who wasn't able to come because, as you know, the first days of a new consular office well, I'm sure that she's acting right now with a lot of work, with a lot of Salvadorians in the area. Uh, we've seen how Salvadorian community has increased during the past years. Now, we are the third Hispanic community in Minnesota area, just behind Mexico and Puerto Rico. So for our country, for our president, Bukele, it is a huge thing to be close to our community. We've heard so many stories of people trying that had trying to go to Chicago. They had to drive more than eight hours with, because of traffic. Um, the location of our consulate right now, we're moving in Chicago, was in downtown. So it was a nightmare for people to go. Just last year, we made six mobile consulates in Minneapolis, thanks to the help of Copal and a lot of um, organizations here. That was a record on the amount of times that as El Salvador Consulate, we came to this state. Last Friday, it was also the first time in history that uh, an authority from our Ministry of Foreign Affairs or Vice, Ma Vice Minister of uh, Diaspora and Human Mobility was in Minnesota. She was the one that made the inauguration. She went to a couple of Salvadorian restaurants. We know I've been here several times if you haven't tried pupusas, I'm sure you should. Uh, and our community increases by the day. We've seen people coming from east and west coast to make Minnesota ho home. I just hope that after the first winter they decide to stay. As someone before said, 
we're a warm country in Central America. If these people are coming from the coast, I'm sure it's gonna be difficult, but resilience is one of the best things that describe a Salvadorian. So I'm sure that we'll be here for a long time and we'll continue to grow. And who knows, probably in a couple of years, we'll be the second because the gap with Mexico is great, <laughs> but we're, Puerto Rico is really low. Thank you. Can you tell us a little bit about Chile as well? Sure. Um, bueno, my name is Teresa um, Palacios also, and I've been uh, the consul for Chile in Minnesota um, almost for eight years. Um, the community of the Chilean probably is not as large as our <laughs> two other um, consuls here. Um, I think in the last census uh, that Chile um, it did, it was in 2017, and it shows that in Minnesota, I think the number of uh, um, Chileans are around 800, 1,000 people. So it, it's probably been growing. I see that every time, every week when I have appointments for people that also, like um, our um, neighbors here, have, uh, you know, people need to do some, uh, you know, um, documentation, stuff like that. Don't need to go to Chicago. So around 1,000 people and um, people that are coming from Chile for work or a new, uh, you know, new experience, new opportunities. And I feel like in Minnesota, they are feeling um, very welcome and they love stay in loves be here. So um, many of them have been insert in different um, areas and different fields, um, even in, in 3Ms, like the place we are right now, uh, it's a large number of Chilean um, working and professionals. So it is great to have that presence in, in big corporations that could help, like uh, we are looking to try to get uh, people involved in our communities to help the rest of the Latin American um, that are working very hard here in Minnesota. Uh, we know how hard the weather is, so make it more hard sometime in the winter with all the, um, you know, things that could struggle or, or not or be hard for um, start a new, um, you know, um, company or new, new jobs and stuff like that. Uh, sometimes it's hard to them to know what to do, where to go, they, how the resources are, where they are, and, and help and guide for their projects. So, um, the, like I said, the Chilean community is really small, um, but then it's growing. There are other presence and other big companies in Minnesota right now, um, and, and they are coming. There are people interested in, in grow and, and have family and, and be in a place where um, it's very diverse. Um, I think uh, we all know that, that it's, it's a big, big change in Minnesota since the 70s or 80s to now. Um, and that is attractive. That is attractive for people like the Chileans that are so far away at the end of the world, down south, but, um, but it's something that has been calling to them as well, so um, so yeah, I'm here to um, be part of this conversation. So very grateful, and thank you for um, the we or all humans for inviting me as well. Thank you. So um, Teresa just talked a little bit about some of the challenges that um, some of her community face, and I'm wondering, Mr. Ambassador, you talked a little bit about opportunities as well, and I'm curious to see. If you know from the folks that you are representing and that you you have the conversations with back at the, the consulate, what are the challenges that they're they're facing on a regular basis here, and what are the opportunities that they're looking for? The the immigrant community um, faces a lot of challenges, but over the years has proven once and again that. It is an endless source of strengths and creativity. And the, the, the right way to enhance this creativity for us, uh, from the government, is to promote leadership initiatives, to do outreach and work with young people. I see so many young faces here that I wanted to share with the, the conference a short video that I shared with the 
the organizers. I, I don't know. Um, I, 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 I thought that it would be projected. It's a, it's a video that uh, uh, has the narrative, a very short narrative of a program that um, we launched three years ago for the first time. The, you know, as, as government, uh, we tend to, 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 to focus on the immediate challenges. But what lies ahead of the curve is more relevant for the future. And what is ahead of the curve is, is young people proving uh, their uh, commitment to a better future. So how we enhance in the United States and in the home countries this um, uh, commitment uh, through community service and volunteering, because every program of volunteering is a program of leadership. It encourages uh, emerging uh, leadership. So in 2019, we put in place the first uh, cultural immersion and volunteering program. Uh, we um, drafted the program in order to address young people that, has just, uh, that have just graduated from college. And the response we had was incredible. I mean, the first program uh, focused in California. Uh, I launched the program in Santa Ana in Orange County, uh, May 1st. We had four weeks in order to get the applications because it was a summer program. And of course, the challenges were many. People already had uh, summer courses, summer jobs, internships. To see so many young people uh, abandoning <laughs> internships, <laughs> postponing jobs in order to go to Mexico, to the homeland of the uh, uh, family, in order to work with the community. And the, the, what we had is that in four short weeks, I, I expected to have like 100 applicants. We had 300. Uh, you know that the University of California has 10 campuses. We had applications from nine campuses, not having uh, uh, spent one cent in promotion. Uh, and of the system of the uh, California State University, they have 23 campuses. We had 22 uh, campuses submitting applications. When I got Celia Aro from Humboldt State in, on the border with Oregon, I, I thought, how <laughs> we had, and we had Harvard, we had Stanford, we had El Camino Community College, uh, Cerrito Community College. We had people that are first generation uh, uh, going to college, and they came to Mexico. And the University of California, that was a partner, they told us, okay, you already had the group. They will come to Mexico. But of course, even from the airport, many will go back home because that, that just is life, that, that happens. Okay, we had 147 people accepted. And my list in Mexico City has 147 signatures. So a 100% commitment by, by young people. And I am very happy to share this information here at 3M because the, first, the very first meeting we had for young people coming in order to do volunteering in Mexico was with the American Chamber of Commerce in Mexico City, AMCHAM, in order for them to explain to learn, to, to open a two-way channel of communication. What can corporate uh, world do with young people in order to enhance this vision of growing together? For, because you see that we have many Mexicans here. Uh, Mexican born population is 11 million people in the United States. But if you have to the, uh, if, you, if you have outreach to the children and grandchildren, you have 30 million people. That is the way to go in order to have better citizens here and better citizens at the home country. That is why I wanted to share if right now, for any reason, it is not possible to project the video. I hope that at the uh, Facebook page of this conference, uh, you can click on, on that video and it is very, very short, and the video was made by the participants, <laughs> not, not by the government. So it is very, you know, spontaneous. Thank you very much.
Federico, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about the same question, kind of the obstacles that, that are faced as well as the opportunities that are sought. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. Yes, well, the first and, and main obstacle for people was obviously get their documents and having to have uh, all the support uh, being given from the city of Chicago, which is around 600 miles away. That's why our president or vice minister, we work hard for the past 18 months. Setting up a new consulate is not an easy task, but with President Bukela, we had to run. Even through the pandemic, we got every, everything. Now our community will be able to get their documents here on site. Um, also, a lot of people, a lot of Salvadorian entrepreneurs that have here a lot of restaurants, have companies of cleaning, have um, uh, several things that we've seen. Uh, we were working with them, uh, trying to support and getting the connections from El Salvador. Now, our new office will be able to help them, will be able to provide them the correct assistance. They sometimes being also there gives them a lot of motivation. Having the consulate by their side, which is why, what our president wants us to do, will do a lot of difference. We've tried and we've worked, at least in Chicago right now, for programs as English as Second Language because we know that it's another huge barrier because a lot of people from El Salvador, they come here and as the day passes, the community grows larger, they decide that English is not as important as it is. Sometimes knowing English opens a lot of door that they might not be seeing because they come, they get a job with a Salvadorian company or they get a job within the Hispanic market but they're not able to grow because they don't know English. It comes to a point where you have to know English in order to get to the next, uh, next level. Uh, I am sure that with this new consulate, uh, it was our 25th consulate in the US, and um, our mission is not only to give the documents, it's not only to issue passports, it's not only to issue the ID. Uh, now we support them all along the way if someone wants to bring Salvadorian nostalgic products, if someone wants to sell stuff back to El Salvador, if someone wants to promote a lot of tourism, sometimes, and we see in the Midwest, uh, like last year, a lot of tourism from the Minnesota area increased in, in going to El Salvador. Why? Because in winter, the temperatures here, there is a lot of people that's working remotely thanks to the pandemic. Well, the world's not gonna, the, the world's not the same after the pandemic. A lot of companies now, they have 100% remote work. Before, everybody had to drive all the way to the office. And even though there's barely traffic here in Minneapolis and St. Paul area, uh, I'm sure that everybody prefers to stay at home and, and work remotely. But we're working hard with our community. I am sure that this huge step of having an, uh, a consulate here will be a lot of difference for our community through the entire Minnesota, and most likely our community will increase by having a consulate here. So a lot of people won't have to travel to Chicago. It was the only city that covers the entire Midwest for El Salvador. You know, I was wondering, um, you know, we, one of the pillars of the conference is about un unity within the Latino community. And I'm curious to see kind of what is it that you all collaborate on together um, to represent all of your communities cohesively? Yeah, um, I, I think it does, uh, it's a good point. Um, somehow we are a little group, um, especially for, I'm talking about Chile, uh, the community is not a, our largest uh, of our Mexican friends. And, and it would be great to get um, a more um, communication between um, now those uh, other um, consuls because um, sometimes people um, has been struggling or looking for same things that the other you know communities are doing and are working hard and sometimes getting the information from first hand uh, or someone is more expert in certain areas can help not just only the Salvador but maybe Ecuadorians or Colombians or Venezuelan. Um, the, the Hispanic community in Minnesota is growing. I can see from um, either southwest area of uh, Twin Cities where um, there are many um, Venezuelans and Colombian in, in Salvador. Um, they are very hard workers and sometimes they don't get the information. They are so hard workers that don't have time for 
and find information or, or make an appointment in another um, office or talk to someone that could help with their ideas of a business or growing. And, and, and sometimes they just end up being an idea and not um, you know, have that project a reality because they don't have the support. And, and, and it's uh, isolated somehow in an area that is not that large that it could be connected. So I can see that if we can work together as a consuls in, in, in Minnesota to get that information more close to, more easily accessible for people, that they can find education, they can um, find some uh, tools to learn about some business that they can do, uh, future entrepreneurs that want to do some uh, restaurants or install uh, a new, um, you know, a farm, farm or even uh, industry, food industry is growing and not just only restaurants, but um, I mean, it's, it's the workforce in Minnesota is a lot of a Mexican. I can see where I'm working right now. Um, I have a full-time job as well. So uh, I can see uh, how they are doing a lot of for this community, for this state. So it will be uh, very, um, important for our role to get to help this uh, whole Latin American um, people in the, in the state. So uh, I think the struggles are those that sometimes people cannot get the information that they need because it's in different areas. We have the uh, Department of uh, Work or um, Employment. We have some other organizations in Minneapolis or in St. Paul and in this doesn't think about going to the consulate sometime for that. So um, unif unify information, unify um, all the resources could help the, all the Latin um, American people in Minnesota to get their um, projects probably more a reality. Mr. Ambassador? I think that um, what the consul Palacio Solson has just said is very relevant that there is a huge potential for the consular offices in Minnesota to do things together to benefit the community. We have the Minnesota Consular Corps as a very important forum in order to to collaborate, but maybe today we can uh, see this specific meeting as day one of a new era of collaboration because uh, we are fortunate enough that between Mexico and Chile, we have the Alianza del Pacifico network that specifically has a branch working in joint initiatives abroad. Uh, we, we set uh, together embassies and consular offices abroad, and with our sister republic of El Salvador. Uh, Mexico has the Tricamex um, mechanism of collaboration in order to offer to the immigrant community uh, legal services, uh, uh, timely advice, um, preventive services, and of course to open new pathways to education and to healthcare. So let's make today day one of this new collaboration. I know we're almost at time, but uh, we started a couple minutes late, uh, but my only job as moderator is to keep us going. So one final question and maybe just a couple of minutes from each of you, but how do you think corporations here in the, in the area can be helpful to, to you and your efforts? For us, um, to promote our community to go to college, to, go, to get a degree. I know that during the morning someone said about scholarships. Uh, people in the Latin America area, they are really resilient. They are really dedicated. Sometimes they work as hard. I've heard about people that they work 20 hours a day. They just sleep for four hours. Then they work over again for 20 hours in order to get their kids to grow older. Now, this uh, era, these people are also working, but I'm sure that if 
these corporations can provide them a motivation to go to college, to get a degree, to learn English, uh, to include a path, a career pathway, which is also really amazing. I've seen a lot of companies in Chicago and in Los Angeles. I was posted in Los Angeles. So these people that see that, okay, I started here, they started from bottom. It's usually how a lot of people has to start. Nobody, no Hispanic that comes to the US has the uh, benefit of starting probably in the sky. They start, they work, they work really hard, they start climbing the ladder, and if, they're, if they, these companies have this career pathway, they are really motivated, and as soon as their times are coming, they study, they prepare, they work, they learn, and I'm sure that with, this cap, this, with these options, or community of Salvadorians, Mexicans, and in the area, as um, Rodolfo was telling earlier before, are probably the less ones that get a degree. I'm sure they will start to getting a degree. We will, I'm sure that most of the people, the ones that are younger than 40, sure that in Minnesota, a lot of people and a lot of things can change for training. You're investing in your own people. You're not expect. You're not spending. You're training them. And the loyalty, as also it was mentioned a couple hours before, we the Hispanic, if we were, if we receive a, stick to it, put it into practice, and make the company as it was our own, and work as hard as we, as we can to produce as much money as we can. The best company that's in the world for us. Um, from me. Uh Um, are working already and and you know and be close to the uh, Hispanic or Latin American community. I think it's sometimes it's, it's just get again the word we can get involved. We can pass that information to our communities projects. I think it, um, like in, in 3M, uh, the month of uh, Hispanic month or uh, celebration. Said it's are happening, but sometimes we don't know about it, and I think that it would be the the great uh, the things to request probably is if something we can ask is just get the word a little bit more out of the um, get it to maybe in this case to the the consular court or this uh, Latin American consul. Well, um, thank you also for. It's a pleasure, and I hope Chileans um, love to, and and I think it's hard for people to go that far, but but as well. So um, thank you, everybody, and hope to talk to all of you. Mr. Ambassador, you want to close us out? I think that everything that um, uh, Mr. Federico has said is, is very, very relevant. And what uh, Consul Palacios Olson has um, uh, said, I just want to, to share with you that um, I have been working the unit of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs for uh, 18 years and at the consulate um, in Sacramento in the year 2005. I remember that U.S. Bank early movers in order to reinvest in the community and what and uh, with other companies, uh, with the Mayo Clinic, with the, the Ecolab, Cargill, is that target, of course, is that uh, Minnesota um, investing in the community. So what we can offer at the Consulate of Mexico, and I think, is that uh, thanks to the closeness to the community, our programs are demand driven. So you achieve when you have ownership in the community, when, when the program is demand driven. And as, as we see, uh, uh, sometimes the sky 
is truly the limit for the for the collaboration. Back in the year 2008, when we were struggling to finance our scholarships, as Consul Guerrero has said, now uh, times are changing. and they, they want to achieve that. Uh, uh, we, we wanted to, to do fundraising, but we had uh, precious little experience in that. So I convened a, a conference for corporate America in the United States, uh, in, uh, coming to Mexico for only for two days. It was 14 years ago. And I remember that my goal was to raise 100,000 US dollars for scholarships. At the very first session, as I just mentioned, that I had this goal, a smallish company from Texas uh, raised the hand. You already have the check here. So <laughs> that means to the demand of the community, the, all the resources, all the resources, they can have an impact not only in in the families, but of the state of Minnesota and the United States at large. Thank you, sir. Well, thank you all for joining us. We really appreciate the perspective. Okay, good afternoon. Do you need to stand up? Everybody stand up, stretch. Yeah, it's been a long Good. Are we good? You can sit down now and we're ready. Very good. Okay, so um, I'll introduce you. My name is Silvia Perez, if I can have you with me. I am the president of the Commercial Solutions Division at 3M and delighted, delighted to host you all today again. Phenomenal panel for you this afternoon and I will let um, Mike Natoya introduce themselves, but we have a fantastic From those, much is expected. It is a quote that our CEO, Mike, often repeats. And when we talk about the Latin, for those of us in corporations or institutions, governmental or not, that have resources, and much is expected to close the opportunity gap. So we heard this morning and throughout the day Latino population. We heard about the needs in academia. We heard about what is needed, kinds of leaders we need. We heard from nonprofits. We heard from the public sector. We heard from politicians. We heard from this particular panel will address in the next half an hour the perspective have signed the Hispanic promise. Executive action to prepare, hire, promote, retain, celebrate Hispanics in the workplace. Together, we will explore how effective um, how effectively we can reach uh, representation numbers that we are all hoping we can do. We talked this morning at 3M, we hope resources and dollars to achieve that goal because we need 
go and recruit, but we need to develop those workers of the future with STEM programs and educational grants. We will today discuss the best practices of this business leaders to do the, all the pillars of the Hispanic promise, which I repeat. and celebrate Hispanics in the workforce by creating this inclusive environment that promotes all employees feeling confident and the best selves to work. And I think that is very important. This morning, Latinos gathering to today it's because we want to make 3M a place where every Latino can be themselves and be at their best on their strengths and who they are. I am going to direct my first question to Maggie. And Maggie, you can share where you're from, uh, but talk about the Hispanic promise that what it has When considering these pillars, best support the advancement of, let, of the Hispanic community within your workforce, com consumers, and community. And I, she has a great story to share. Well, I know we only have a half hour, right? So I can't talk about all the things we're doing, all these various pillars, but I will talk about what we're doing to promote. And I think we all have seen it in most organizations where you have this middle manager being black and brown communities representative at the top. And so we created a program designed to bust through the I work at U.S. Bank in diversity, equity, and inclusion. I manage the military and veteran segment as well as the Hispanic segment at the company. And the Hispanic Promise back in 2019, right before I joined the organization. And uh, I came in. Numbers, like we got some work to do. But, but here's a problem. Great programs out there, but the program, right? So it's the system. And it's to really look back at our human resources policies, how we are promoting folks. Because what happens is you have this great program, folks go through again, they don't see any movement in their career, they get frustrated, and you just train them to leave, right? They're gonna go somewhere else. So we had to figure out how can we make this not only possible, but so we worked very closely and to really address those gaps by piloting it with 20 amazing um, Hispanic leaders that are in that mid-level range, who are high-performing, high-potential. And we, we were very intentional. So we have representatives from every single line of business. Think about that in itself for a second. That something done. I got a friend over in this department, a friend over in that department. This, that's how you get started putting together the actual program itself. Programs, right? We take talented people and we put them in a program, right? Try to fit them into that box. What we wanted to do is develop the program. Each individual, we figure out in the beginning what their plan is. We give them executive coaches. We get the mentors. We're doing the uh, development programming with them. And then we work on how to best support them, how to get programming. Um, there's the connection and the support piece, right? So we're making sure that they're not just working with their managers, but skip level managers. They're going all the way up to the most senior leaders in the organization and getting these TED Talk style one-on-one -on -one senior leaders and everyone knows who these folks are, right? This, this, is, this is unique.
Folks go through all this work, do all this development, and their manager doesn't have a line of sight to support them. So we have them going through a parallel journey with the participant, and we did this program in partnership with Dr. Robert Rogers, how to understand the Latinx talent, how to understand how that identity shows up in the workplace, we're teaching our managers to be more welcoming. And so now we're able to, be able to create this community between the managers who are just as invested in their employees at the same time. And I know I'm running low on time, so I'll try to wrap this one up. $16 million, million dollar commitment to break down the and this year, we're really going down, doubling down to the Hispanic community. And these 20 individuals that represent all areas of the organization are helping us build that business case and how we're going to go to market, who, what we need to do, how we're going to do it, how do we earn that trust. And um, it's making my job a lot easier because now I've got 20 brilliant minds helping me do that work. And um, they're going to be actually pitching that to the CEO at the end of this program. And that's So we didn't want to give them busy work but something that they can actually do that's going to impact not only the company, but the community. So is it Zhang? Huh? Zhang, the name of the program? Oh. Hispanic lead? Yes. Okay. It's so, really a long So how about a round of applause for this incredible, incredible just about lifting Latinos just like a, a whole circle of plastic. Um, Natoya is going to address our well, so uh, when we consider our Hispanic workforce, um, they're prepared to meet the challenges and capture the opportunities of a productive engagement. Walker Miner, and I'm so glad to be here. Deputy General Manager for the Greater Cleveland signed the Hispanic Promise, and we were proud to sign that because I am new on my job, about a year and a half, and I'm the first person. How do you do it? How do you the majority of the employees are black and brown because they're the bus operators, but they don't have any authority. They don't have any financial prowess. They don't contribute to the policy of the organization. So when you're in an organization like that and you have uh, non-minorities in engineering, in finance, in, uh, in planning. Why do we need diversity, equity, inclusion? What does that mean? Is that going to take a job away from me? What does that mean? And so I am working to decrease anxiety, increase engagement and understanding, and that's education with my colleagues. I say that I've been doing diversity, equity, and inclusion before it was a thing because I've been doing it since I was 14. Because I was in the first class of busing in Cleveland, Ohio in 1978. When we were bused, us brown kids were bused to the west side of Cleveland so that we can get to educational parity. This is on the heels of the civil rights movement. So 13 years later, school systems across this country fighting for educational parity. In Cleveland, that resulted in busing, taking black and brown kids from the east side to the west side. And what we found then and what I find today is it was parents at that time, we don't want busing, we don't want busing, this is not good. And you know they were afraid. But my peers in school, they were not afraid. And so I became friends with people who didn't look like me. I've been doing diversity since I was 14. 
And then when I was 27, I went into a program called the National Urban Fellows. If you've not heard of it, write it down, NUF.org. It is a program designed for black and brown students to earn a graduate degree in public policy. And so I was in a cohort of 20 people. And that is where I learned Latinx because before that, right, this is 27 years ago, before that, I just said Puerto Rican or Mexican. But in my class, I had Panamanians, El Salvadorians, Chileans. And so it was there that I learned this is so much broader than a single word. You cannot categorize people in that way. And so taking the time to learn and understand differences in culture are critical. And taking enough time so that you can educate and inform your colleagues so that you can get the engagement and the buy-in that you need. And if there's one thing that I can leave with each of you as you continue to do this work is understand the systems in the room. Look for allies. Educate the allies. Look for those that aren't on board and continuously drop them tips to education and understanding because we don't need to be fighting this. We have to continue to move forward with fact in a way that does not intimidate or create anxiety because folk get scared. Folk get real scared. And it's in a book called White Fragility, if you don't believe me, check it out. Folk get real scared. And so you need to, we need to build allies as we move forward, always keeping our eye on the prize and being conscientious of what's behind door number two and thinking forward so that we can navigate within the system to move our initiative forward. That's good. I want to double click on something. I want to double speak. click on something you just said. Um, you really touched on the organization, right? And, and knowing how to navigate that. And you know, just to add on to that, right? Uh, get involved in your BRGs. We actually recently just did our studies, and we have KPIs showing that our Nosotros Latinos BRG has a 40. If you serve on the board, you have a 41 percent higher chance of getting promoted within the organization. I see my, my leaders high-fiving each other over there. I'm like, yes. Um, but it actually, we actually have data now to support that. So not only does it increase the retention of employees, but it's going to get you a better chance of getting promoted due to the sheer visibility and the uh, learning experience that you get from it as well. I now, promised now, you this was going to be really good. <laughs> Go ahead. I will do well. I mean, my goodness. So, but. Natoya, this is incredible because not only are you a trailblazer in the transportation, or, you know, that's unheard of power to you. So, Mike, you're going to do great. Uh, <laughs> Mike, can you talk to us about Hispanic activation? And this is a great question. For Mike, because he comes from a consumer company, and so um, how could we encourage more companies to harness the Hispanic promise and opportunity that the Hispanic consumer represent? It's a really good question. I wish we had more time. We, oh, we have time. Um, <laughs> there's a lot to it, and the answer is already provided. Um, speak to this. I'm the head of diversity, equity, and inclusion, and soon to be belonging um, as well, which will incorporate and wrap that in for this December eight years. Extremely important, but just to sign the Hispanic promise doesn't do enough. So to sign the Hispanic promise, tell folks when I talk to them is that DE and I work is messy. DE and I work is real messy. Everything that was laid out already 
That's the, the, that's the, the tentacles of success. But if you listen to their words, and I probably sitting in this seat, I was in sales for a very long time. Listening to what they just said, I'd be like, yes, that sounds amazing. But now sitting in their seats as far as how When you present the Hispanic promise, and you say, this is what we're going to stand for, and this is what we're going to be about, I think each organization needs to have employee resources. You have to, or as part of the employee resource group that you belong to, be your authentic self. But you've created the environment for that to happen. And so we say, hire and retain. That's really sexy, right? Like that, that's, what it, that's the utopia. But then the challenge comes in is Hispanic, black, and brown, LGBTQ, veteran, any other people group. How do we to belonging? Because when we talk about diversity and inclusion, and we focus on diversity, it's, you, you inherently are talking about other groups, not white. Why is belonging? We have everyone as part of the conversation, right? So that's when our work and when I started and I took over post-George Floyd, what does it sound like? What does it feel like? On Hispanic culture. And as the rainbow of that. Understand it. That's good. This is the reason why you are a participant in this conversation. I able to confidently speak this language, and that's the, the learning opportunity for everyone. Confidently speak this language. I, too, uh, was part of the first cohort group of inner city students in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, to be bussed out as part of the 220 program in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, to take inner city kids uh, and be educated in the suburbs. I then went on to predominantly white ACU. The reason why I say that, I was able to be able to navigate get down to this level of conversation. You have to get people comfortable to say, it's okay. And the work that we have to do is giving people the benefit of the doubt. Okay, this is the cultural competency learning opportunity that we have before. Thank you. Anything? It's messy. It's in fact quite ugly and, and painful. And painful. But it is critically important that we become comfortable with discomfort mm -hmm. because it is an uncomfortable, not for you, the advocate, but it is, it is uncomfortable for who is a Caucasian mm -hmm. because they don't want to step on any nails or trip themselves up because they're trying to understand always have to find ourselves in a posture of education. And, and that can be difficult because at times, depending what we're dealing with, the, the microaggressions are like, okay, hold. The one thing that I've learned is the power of pause. Incredible. It is transforming.
And a lot of times it is better to pause than to proceed because what comes out next, and we need to create allies. One, just to piggyback on that. Um, speaking to the courage and how at times it can be messy. Even when, when I'm talking to our senior leadership, our executive, and, and asking, have to bring up the word whiteness. For me, I've been in the CPG industry for a very long time. And so when I'm advocating, point to systemic historical things that have taken place on the reason or begin to shake. I literally shake in my seat. This is, this is as real as real gets. A group of individuals, white men and women, and I haven't educated them on at that particular time just because of time constraint and busy schedule that we really do need to have a conversation and take a deep breath we're going to talk. If we don't have that time to take a deep breath and say that we're going to talk about race and the immediacy of something, a decision needing to be made, and I'm saying the reason why I'm associated with Hispanic individuals and I need $500,000 because I got 20 kids that I want to send to school. I begin to shake. And so this is the reason why we started with language. We started with conversation. If I say Hispanic, if I say Latin X, it's okay. It's okay. We're going to go through this journey and this process together, but one, two, three, let's breathe. We're going to. Great. So we haven't done this today because we do, we're doing really well on time. And yes. That's a great question. I'll get started and then a little bit colleagues kind of hop in. So first, Right, um, I would definitely work with our friends here at We're All Here. What they do, they can help consult you, work with you, and help you get these infrastructures built up. Um, but I think building the community, right? Identity. Like, what's the mission? What are you trying to achieve within, you know, the student base? Case, and I think that you'll find. That's where a lot of people get hung up when they're trying to get these started, right? How do we get that senior approval of this program? How do we get that off the ground? Across these various functions, never. That's where the We Are All Human can come in and help out. Free for you to reach out to me on LinkedIn. I'm colleagues here would also be happy to help out. Place to start in, uh, start it based on. So if any of you guys. Just um, uh, there are order in Cleveland. Uh, it's to make sure they complete college. Okay. Uh, Twenty-eight years ago, when I was in my graduate program as a national. Latinx colleagues who didn't complete high school, the numbers haven't shifted that much. So we've got to make sure we have mentorship programs, coaching programs. Our young people, our future, are educated and the mantle because it is a journey. 
And so we've got to make sure they're prepared that when we say stick, they're ready to stand level. I'm glad you said Esperanza. It's a great organization. There's a lot of great Just so you know, McKinsey has a managerial program that is free. That is free by McKinsey. Make sure you reach out to them to do it. So they have a black, Asian, and Hispanic uh, leadership development program. You can do up to 20 folks through a cohort, and it is the top of the line development. So I highly recommend looking at them as well. Uh, I, I would uh, add for the Hispanic. of hiring folks from SHIP. Hispanic as well, and all these organizations. I also think accountability on corporations. We donate a lot of money to colleges and universities. And um, one of the universities that I'm working with, we are how they get allocated in terms G's not help, you know, scholarships and even if still in STEM and science things that so we're fired to make it fun, and so I'm going to start uh, with um, Natoya on the other end. In the future, young people make sure they get through high school, prepare, they get to college, they're to lead. <laughs> Maggie, Hispanic promise, what does it mean to you? The, work, work, the workforce of the future today. <laughs> Unless everyone's included. Very good. I'm going back there. Uh, so, to do less of less of being uh, feeling like you have to assimilate, be authentic. I um, I tell Latinos to do more of go out there and get that DNI moment. Adding inclusive to our leadership attributes for a company. For Our core idea. leadership attributes, we added inclusive. Very good. And the last one, uh, your favorite Latino author. Well, the, the author that I had said, Sonia Sanchez, is actually African American. I remember, I do have a quote for you all from the Farmers. She started the United Farmers. So powerful for the moment. We are needed. We have to be engaged and get ourselves elected to school boards and city councils, and I'll add to state representatives and to everywhere where policy is influenced. Because policies, policies become have performance metrics. We've got to move our people through programs. Thank you. And favorite dance. <laughs> and last one, Mike, favorite Latino dish. Uh, toquitos. Of applause to this amazing panel. Thank you so much. And I guess I have to introduce the next speakers. Uh, or not. Uh, Hispanic community. Buenas tardes. Good afternoon. This is a great group, and we're very happy to be here. This next the Latino consumer, Latino market, if you 
or brand that would like to get the Latino community to buy your product or to buy into your day. I am a very Santa Maria, La Raza, and I'm with Maria Moreno. Hola. <laughs> Yes, and I first access television show. Yes, uh, we uh, do, uh, especially we support a lot of uh, Latino entrepreneurs. So we help them start their business, get the word out there for people to know what they're doing. Uh, so many people that want to start the business to be their own bosses, so it's very, very cool. About, what, about a year old, yeah, more or less? A year and a half. Very excited. Um, yeah, so we're ready to just keep moving. So it's a very interesting uh, way of starting this conversation because I think that uh, Entre Panas has a, a, a great insight to talk about some of the, the burning questions. Opportunities, Maria, do you see in? You know, uh, United States is the second largest Spanish speaking country in the world after Mexico. So I think that's just, I'm gonna set up. We're all here, we're ready to go and we are here. As we know, the Latino community in the U.S. is the largest majority in, uh, in terms of market. This year, uh, there are $2 trillion in Latinos across the country, and that's a large market share. It's a market share that a lot of the Latino media are working hard to get a piece of the groups and the organizations and brands that are interested in reaching out to the market. Uh, very interested in where those dollars will be spent and how will they be spent. And for those of us that work in this field, um, we know that part of that, with an authentic voice, uh, needs to be done by Latinos for Latinos. And uh, I think that's a very important part of um, the opportunity, the opportunity to share our culture, the opportunity to what needs to be done with a culture own particular rhythm and own particular feeling that we have as Latinos behind it and something that will be accepted by the market as well. So um, conversely, what are the challenges that you see in reaching the Hispanic market? Um, to be honest, I think that education to help the Latinos start their business, help them with marketing, um, start their own website, just many a lot of Latinos don't know about this um, opportunities out there, so I think that you know, using in my in my um, sense, I can use the show as a venue for them to know, get to know all these out there to be able to start their business. Have you ever run across an organization that really just doesn't understand the Latino market at all? Have you had to have a conversation with them about? Okay, yes. vamos a empezar desde el principio. <laughs> yes, very much so. I, um, I was invited to a couple of uh, meetings with some Chamber of Commerce members from different cities in, in Minnesota. And, you know, they have great ideas. They have um, great information. They not to know what the Latino market needs. Um, they usually don't have somebody to translate in these meetings, which is, you know, language barrier is a huge um, barrier and this kind of organization, so that's something I ran into. And another challenge I think that um, advertisers have is that they don't always understand that we're not a monolith, mm -hmm. that often, um, oftentimes if you're going to do a commercial, let's say for example, that has a very strong Puerto Rican accent and feel and some great salsa music behind it, it's not necessarily gonna be or if you're in Houston or in, El in areas in Minnesota. So you really have to know the demographics of the market exactly. that you're talking to. Um, you're doing the media buys for, what is the demographic in that area? Who do you reach out to? How do you reach out to our communities, right? 
Amalia's family that are Guatemala. Uh, Alfredo's family, los Boricuas que vienen de otro lado, you know, so is it is it a Midwest culture? We in the Midwest, the Latinos here, we have our own culture too, right? Mm -hmm. We can yep. say that we're very different if you go to another as, you know, uh, necessarily of the ethnic groups that their parents or grandparents came from, but because they've created their own geographic subcultures and you have to know how to talk to each of those so that goes from uh, the way that you, that your talent speaks, the accents, the de fondo, you know, all of the uh, the way that contextually you all has to be considered culturally, geographically, demographically when you are creating an advertising campaign for a client, organization, group. It's a different approach, and those are the those are the things that we as Latinos. But when you're reaching out to a client that is not someone within the Latino community, you have to hold them by the hand sometimes. You we'll, we'll create it for you. If it's for country, we need to do it a little differently. Panas. Yes. Not all people know what Panas is. Panas is used in certain countries, but not in all the Latino countries. So, yeah, absolutely. Very much so. yeah. Tell us a little bit more about your group. Fun. I've yes. enjoyed it a lot. Yes, Hablando Entre Panas is a lot of fun. We have, um, I, we have about six people that are part of Ecuador, Colombia, Venezuela, Mexico. We have a lot of fun doing it. Um, like I said, we, you know, we help a lot of enterprises to their business. Um, we do la, la patadita a lot with uh, people that come and sing for the first time in our show. I mean, the Latino culture is so rich. When, whenever somebody says, tell me, what should we do to, to attract people? I just think, think of the movie Encanto. Encanto is just everything we are. We're colorful, we're fun, we're music. And that's what we try to do in our show as well. And yeah, it's a perfect way of reaching yeah. out to us is by just pulling out our and make us the same, our similarities, like the love of music, the love of comida, familia, other fiestas, compartir, all of, the, all of those things is something that we all have in common. Right. And so I think that the show is a great, a great example of yeah. that as well. Yes. Um, Maria, how do you believe that the um, Minnesota Latino community has evolved over the last decade? Oh my gosh. You know, I've been here for 33 years, and I'm going to tell you a story. When on Sundays, we would drive to El Burrito Mercado in St. Paul to get to something as close as we could to Ecuador, because there was nothing else. Now, I get out in every corner, and I can have Ecuador, Mexico, Ecuador, amazing Ecuadorian food everywhere. So, yeah, I mean, we're all over the That's true. It's yeah. grown quite a bit. I mean, you walk into Target, your house possibly, maybe not, yeah. and they have the Latino section, and you can get your tomatillos, and you can get your, you know, whatever it is that Empanadas. you want to get. You, yeah, you can't really get the pupusas or anything like that, but you can get some of, some of the Latino foods, you know. That so, yeah. um, We can get guinea pig, too, now. You can get it? No, no, got foods. No, <laughs> special places, special places. See me afterwards. I'll tell you where. <laughs> what do they call it in Ecuador again? Cuy. Cuy el cuy. That's right. Cuy, cuy, muy bueno. Exactly. You, can, you can reach out to the Ecuadorianos in town and let them know That's where right. the best cuy is. Yes. <laughs> There's always an opportunity. So, and stakeholders, because there may be some here in the room. What do they need to know to better? I think we covered a lot of that already. Um, not even though we're all Latinos and we have a common language, which is Spanish, we still have some key words that need to be used. Um, and also, I, I think that the Latinos are, like I said, we're colorful, we're fun, 
So just incorporate that into what they're uh, projecting. Yeah, and I think also the, the Latinos in Minnesota uh, and I think across the country we could say the same. We've become a lot more sophisticated mm -hmm. with our marketing and it used to be that our community can choose where it's getting its information and its advertising from the handhelds in their hand. Mm -hmm. And they're getting their advertising and marketing through untraditional sources like TikTok and YouTube and other venues. So they can actually pick and choose the kind of advertising and messaging that they're getting. Um, and people, and some people do still want to switch on the public access channel and switch on La Radio. Um, of course, mm -hmm. the, those, the TV and radio don't go away, but there's also all of this additional flood of information and marketing that's so, um, you need to be doing more comprehensive campaigns exactly, with digital, yeah. radio, TV, a combo. Social media. Um, and how can we better equip brands and organizations with a comprehensive understanding of us as consumers, the Latino community? Many that work for the other, so we just always have to think about that too, I think. And I found that it's, it's really important as media organizations act as consultants. Mm -hmm. So we're not only just selling advertising as if they had, if, if you would walk up to, you know, WCCO or Hubbard Broadcasting and want to buy ads for your brand uh, in the English mainstream market, it's pretty easy. found it is us as a Latino media, uh, we have to really educate, consult, mm -hmm. create, produce, mm -hmm. and do kind of the full campaign as like an agency, an advertising agency, in order to be right. able to be consultants to those brands so that their message is going to be received in a culturally appropriate and linguistic with, linguistically appropriate way. And so really, it's of educators and consultants. I'm just glad I have a team of people behind me because I couldn't do it all. <laughs> I can sit in front of a camera and ask questions, but everything else, I, I let the experts share one of our uh, talent, talented team members. We so sure that's do. kind of that's a lot of fun. Yes. So uh, shout out to Loca, yeah. La Loca. <laughs> um, and we know that Latinos. and culturally um, different. But with this in mind, what are effective strategies to reach out to the diverse groups? Well, you know, I just keep going back to the same thing. I, communication is here. Like I said, not a lot of people know of all the... So just opening that, um, asking organizations to do more, uh, maybe... appropriately represented Latinos. The festival that we did, uh, it was a four-day uh, festival that we did with the city of Bloomington in Richfield, and we had anything from uh, organizations, again, speaking about different programs they have. We had a fashion show. Different. So just doing things like that when we can. Very yeah, good. Yeah, yeah, I think of a campaign here locally. For example, um, one of our our most creative, you know, it comes second nature to them. They've really done an amazing job of reaching out to different segments within the nationally. Um, I, I, you know, I think Horizon Media has done some really interesting campaign that they did for Modelo. Did you guys, did anybody here see uh, the campaign with Mark Machado? Machado from, he, he's called like the cartoon. 
And he is a guy out of LA that's a tattoo artist and Modelo did a great campaign with him. Another one of the features in that campaign was It does the uh, the hairdresser for a lot of the the stars in sports. Sleeping in his car and not having any money and crossing the border, and and those kind of campaigns. One the had a very English feel, but the a Latino accent. The um, the Philly Garcia one was in Spanish, and so they're doing these kind of cultural empowerment type of campaigns. Those are fantastic campaigns. Feelings in the community, but I think something like um, Somos Luchadores. Pride in the Latino community out. And so I thought that that was a really effective in media. Um, a friend of mine uh, owns uh, Lopez um, Negrete in this year for Walmart, for McDonald's, and some uh, for FEMA. Some of the FEMA campaigns. Um, hopefully, you get to see some of them in the Latino media. Were, were particularly effective. They they that that uh, could be looked at as as ones to copy. So, um, great, thank you, Maria. And uh, we just have a couple more questions here, and I think we may even have time for some questions. Community advancement. Oh my gosh. Um, I think we can start with our youth, right? Um, our youth is very hungry to learn and to help You know, maybe have um, leaders go to high schools and, and talk to the communities like Bloomington, Richfield. Uh, the students have different programs where leaders can join and, and talk about different opportunities to grow. So go with the kids. Yeah, one, one that I, I think of is um, Comcast and Xfinity, the campaign that they did this year. Um, it was but it wasn't just this year. And they not only offered extremely inexpensive community that was having some financial hardships during COVID, um, I believe it was like $35 for um, So they did a big marketing campaign in communities of color, not just Hispanic communities, but um, definitely Spanish around that. But they also did up zones around the lot of um, you know lower income populations people that may not have access to internet and we're struggling getting struggling connecting to distance learning and connect to the internet and and or anything else that they wanted to do. So that was one example that I saw that I thought was a way that not only it with a great to the community mm -hmm. and uplifted the community in time and time when we all really need that was a that was a fantastic campaign and they and they did help out and they're still doing it. Yeah. And another thing that they did was for Latino entrepreneurs. have businesses to become better entrepreneurs. So those kind of programs, they win because they acquire more Latino and more people of color um, in, their, in their client base, but they're also giving back. Doesn't know about them. So again, we go back to um, educating and getting about, okay, now that you're doing all the great work in the community, let's promote it, let's talk about it, let's get it out there because... Canto hablando entre panas. Yeah, our... La raza. ...the word, but often, you know, they don't, they don't reach out and they don't get the word out appropriately. Right. 
and sometimes it's a, la a, a, a waste of their resources. They're doing great programming and Definitely. then they don't get the right participation. And um, let's talk about perception. What can our industries do to tackle the perception and narratives in general? Specifically negative stereotypes about our, our communities our media. What? Negative stereotypes? <laughs> um, try not to think about that. I think that Latinos are great. We're, we're amazing. I mean, we make life a lot more fun, right? So um, I've been to live in this country for so long. I've never had to have any issues, anything negative so far. And I hope it's going to stay that way. However, my daughter, uh, who just graduated from college, and she had mentioned a couple of times that, they, um, that she was seen differently or she, talked, she was being talked. I've been blinded by my own uh, mind, not wanting to see or feel that way. But, um, I mean, I think that... Um, as minorities, we probably do encounter that. Yeah. And when we're reporting, Latinos reporting about our issues, we're going to have a much different kind of approach when we're approaching the subject matter. So always in advertising or even in um, aspects of our media organization, be authentic with our voice and be able to see and how we approach a certain situation. And that is why Latino media we need to be there providing a voice for our community and not allowing other people to write our narrative. And just be proud. I think that, you know, whenever we walk into a room, we're just proud of who we are, and that makes just a huge difference. I mean, negative things might be happening around us, but just by us feeling proud of be feeling Does anyone have any other questions? Now is your time. Come on. Channel 16. Yes, <laughs> Well, that the key word is balance. Mm -hmm. You want to balance both sides of both neighbors, right? You don't want to be on one extreme or the other extreme. So you don't want to completely deny your ancestry, right? You don't want to say to your children, don't speak Spanish, because we know that it's a benefit. That that's going to give them more opportunities when they're older. Mm -hmm. But 
like you say, you don't want to be completely cut off from the society that we're living in here in the United States. So you need border and the other foot on the other side of the border and be bilingual and bicultural. I think that's been the way that, uh, at least in our family, we've approached it. Same here, same here. Um, Every time we meet someone, you know, my especially my little one, my ten year old always says So <laughs> just you know, again we go to the fact that we have to be proud of who we are to make it better. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, we are closing in on the end, but we have um, one more speaker this morning or this afternoon. Here, I'm so honored and excited that uh, this person has decided to uh, join um, his comments. I think we talk about sponsorship and mentorship and allyship, and you know, what more could we ask for? Minnesota, and this is even more exciting for you. Um, great allyship from our mayor of Minneapolis. So I'd like to welcome Jacob Fry to the stage to, um, to these topics that we're talking about today. Well, thank you so much, uh, Beth, for having me today uh, and 3M for hosting. Uh, my name is Jacob Good to be here with all of you today. Buenos tardes, me llamo Jacobo Fry. Yo soy It's it's really a, a great honor to be here with with all of about the this Hispanic and specifically this concept of we all are human. And that's something that resonates, something that should resonate with everyone throughout our entire country. Box ourselves into these finite patterns. We, we box ourselves literally into boundaries. We, we set up walls. Uh, we, we designate areas where you are supposed to and are not supposed to go. All of this is entirely arbitrary. All this runs counter to the underlying principle that we're all people, deep down. We're human beings, and we should be treated as such. And I don't think that's too much to ask. Uh, specifically right now, I, I, I want to just take a moment to touch on this, the crisis that we have at the border that is a man-made crisis. Uh, this is policy that has been implemented intentionally are programs which haven't been carried out in full to help people and to service people the way that they need. Uh, and it hasn't necessarily always been that way. Now for, and I'm going to get into the rest of the topics later, but, but when this is just something that I'm particularly passionate about right now, the way our structure is set up, the way our immigrants the way we prevent people uh, from moving to seasonal or permanently, uh, the way we set it up now is not only an immoral decision, because people are, are barred from their loved ones, families, because it does not allow us to realize the full potential of human capital that we have both right now in our country, we have more than a few jobs that are available. In fact, we've where almost every employer, including 3M, where we are located right now, is in search of really talented people. Of Minneapolis has always relied on the talent 
of our immigrant neighbors, bolstering the economic vitality of everything that we have going on in our city, and especially right now, especially right now as we come back, as we recover from a global pandemic, as we try to get back not just truly transformational, we have leaders that are not just asking in the work that we're doing. And I'll, just to give you an example or two about what this looks like practically, I want to talk about East Lake Street. How many of you are familiar with East Lake Street? How many of you are from here in general or live here in general? Okay. And are from East, East Lake For those that do know, it's an ordinary place. Uh, you can walk down the street, and there's like a thousand different kinds of tastes packed in on the same block that is created by this interconnectivity of human beings that is literally woven right onto the uh, There's a thousand different backgrounds and mentalities. There's a ton of different races. And the, uh, the Latino community is, is, is tried and true on this corridor uh, and in the surrounding blocks and neighborhoods specifically. Uh, I mean, you, you hear Spanish on almost every single block and everybody uh, from residents to business global pandemic these past couple of years. Now, tragically, the same areas that were hardest hit by the areas that were hardest hit Floyd. And so that's hit and then hit again. And then there was an economic downturn. And then there's a all of the other things that we all collectively Perhaps one of the things that has been the most apparent is the resilience, the resilience of an extraordinary people that adds every day. They're strong, they're coming back. And when I go and I talk to business owners over there, what I also love is they're really looking for are not extraordinary in that they are fair and honest asks. Give us the canvas so that we can help. We want to make sure the corridor is safe so that we can get both our customers in uh, and we can get our workers and way. Opportunities for is the essence, I believe, of correlation between hard work type a little bit here. I mean, these are incredibly hard. Yeah. And I, I'm a believer, if you were to like take the core essence of beliefs of my ideology, of, of the philosophy that I guide myself by, I want to create between hard work and success. I, I ran for Team USA than anything else, is that if you work with the person that's standing next to you on the starting line, you're probably going to beat them. I believe that if you work hard, you should see a direct access to gain. Part of that is set up in a way that is not fair to everyone. So depending on who your parents much more difficulty at times in getting. And so there's a few things that we're trying to dynamic. One, as it presently sits, an example again. them from our Latino community, uh, they have 
put in blood, sweat, and tears to making their business wonderful. In making their business wonderful, they made that corridor wonderful. In making that corridor wonderful, the neighborhood becomes a more trafficked area. Suddenly, hey, we can make more money if we jack the rents a little bit. The value people that made these communities wonderful because they can't pay the rent. Well, let's flip that on its head. Equity is a business term. Equity is a business term means when things get better, you have a it means you have an ownership interest. So that when those values go up, you're the one these businesses, these small and local businesses, are the ones that are able to reap the benefit of those. That help to bridge the. Have the ability, not just to own their own business, but to. crazy radical idea. This is an idea that has been put out by American governments generation after generation. If you think back to the GI Bill, you know, the, when people came home from World War II, white people, they come back in. It's a great idea given to a few people. They come back and there was this whole beautiful vision of, you know, white suburbs, you have the family, you have a mortgage, and then you own. You own the home. And then you can pass that home on to your kids, and you can build intergenerational wealth. And the previous generation. That's this whole concept. That's what we're trying to change right now. And there's so now that are wildly successful, whether that's in foundational, nonprofit, I'm a believer that you know when we work together, we gain much more progress here. And so that's the goal that is happening right now. And and I've I've learned just a bit about what you've talked about the rest of the day. I some of these extraordinary presenters that my staff have informed me about. Uh, so, you that are visiting, which is Minneapolis, and, and spend, spend your, your time and your money and hang out there for a little bit, we would love to have you. And if you do really get a chance and make an intentional effort over this next week or so to check out East Lake, that place in fine form right now. Million people that call it their home every single day. Uh, thank you so much for, for having together. It's an honor to work with you. Thank you. All right, we are, <laughs> we are, we are at the end here. Um, those comments and uh, for making the time to come and visit with us today. One of my favorite places to, uh, to go to. So I'm looking forward to seeing it revitalized and and growing and and Street. Um, so was fabulous. I don't even know what to say about those, yeah. those two, those two uh, panels that we had. Um, really, really great food for thought. I love as somebody who, you know, Hispanic promise. Wow, you guys have lives through you and all of our really a highlight for me to see um, um, just a little thing that I want to tell you is 
advertisers. Boom, I couldn't get it there for a minute. Um, ANA it, it put through a um, effort a couple of years ago led by and Mark Pritchard, who is, is to represent um, all people more positively in advertising. And so through ANA, say, quit stereotyping. Um, Hispanic directors and producers and talent in your ad manner. And so, you know, I know that when I was doing advertising as a CMO at Principal Financial Group, and if you go and look at some ads that we did on Principal, we really did try to show, you know, families that were uh, come from all places. And so hopefully that this effort that ANA is continuing to push will make a difference, but it's not just about the talent. It's about the people behind the camera as well. Mm -hmm. Progress, but so much more needs to be done. So anyway, major highlights. What about you? You know, I think the key, especially this afternoon. It, oh, sorry. It's because I'm really short. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think the key message is throughout the day, and especially in this afternoon, is is something I sum up very simply. Um, On, and they talked about, you know, equity without inclusion. And that one, we're resilient. One, we have a uh, the call to action being uh, as well as when I listened to the panel in regards to, to DEI, what came to my mind was we want to be about substance and not symbolism. And so that call to action has been resounding throughout the day. Is paths and, and action outcome oriented individual. We either do it or we don't. And collectively, we can do so. So, the, uh, just as a, I want a very special thank you again to 3M. I mean, you have uh, opened up your doors to us, you've brought us. Investment of time, your response of resources. Uh, this is substance. Bills, uh, U.S. Bank, and the great co-chairs and the strategic committees is the very first We Are Humans uh, Foundation's first time in Minnesota, and here at 3M, we know. There's going to be a reception right outside. Oh. So Jimmy Lagoria is okay. in the back and wanted to have a quick word. Uh oh. Yeah, it, it's on, right? I'm not talking. Okay. Um, multitasking is a Latino genetic attribute. <laughs> so while I was listening to all these things, and particularly the mayor from Minneapolis, um, I was also finishing up the work that you all, who participated at the lunch and put together your So I want to say thank you to 3M. And Marlena, where are you? Thing. Um, here's the thing. The very powerful message that we have today is get up and go. Let's do. This is our time. And actually, it's going to be our time for the next 20 years, and then we're all too old to care. Yeah. <laughs> But um, this is an interesting material, and I'm going to introduce it to all of you right here. Is because quick and clean, mm -hmm. and it can be used to change the way in which our cities look. Bring with 3M to incorporate the material into it. Think about that. And remember what I said earlier. If you don't have a Longoria in your office, I'm sorry for you. <laughs> because this is the future. I'm not kidding anymore, OK? If you don't like my work, find another, another Latino. But have a Latino in your office. Walk out, because they're not. 
All right. Uh, I've just been told that the uh, reception is. Thank you very much. Thank you.